Project 2025, if he is elected. I'm here because we believe in democracy. Everyone's voice matters, but I am speaking now. I am speaking now. He intends to surrender our fight against the climate crisis, and he intends to end the Affordable Care Act. You know what? If you want Donald Trump to win, then say that, otherwise I'm speaking. What you just watched happened at a Kamala Harris rally in Detroit, Michigan. And for those who don't know, Metro Detroit has the largest Arabic speaking community in the country. And a large number of first generation Arab American immigrants who now live there were once refugees, many of whom still have family in the Middle East. And a lot of them lost family members over the past year due to Israel's genocide in Gaza. So basically any politician who sets foot there during an ongoing genocide is almost certainly going to be confronted about it. So that event right there wasn't necessarily surprising to me. Now, the three or four Muslim women that were shouting at Kamala weren't actually affiliated with the uncommitted movement, contrary to popular belief. Now, we'll get to comments from the organizers of the uncommitted movement in a moment, but I think it's always important to look at what protesters are protesting. And it's this, you're looking at a scene from Khan Yunus where thousands of Gazans are being forced to leave once again. And while these people were forced to flee, 15 others were murdered during an IDF bombing of the Burij refugee camp. So it's okay to be excited about political campaigns, obviously, but it's also important to remember why we care about politics in the first place. We want to help people. And the women who disrupted Kamala's speech, they're hurting right now. And they're reminding Kamala Harris that this issue isn't going to go away. So if you support Kamala and you want her to win like I do, understand that things like this, they tend to make candidates better, even if in the moment you might be a little bit irritated with the protesters and why they're protesting. And I say this because back in 2015, Black Lives Matter actually protested Bernie Sanders. They disrupted his rally in Seattle, Washington, when he was running for president for the first time. And even though he gave them the microphone and let them speak, you could tell he was still very defensive about what they did. And listen, protesters are meant to make politicians feel uncomfortable. You can call it performative. You can ask why they weren't protesting other candidates. You're even free to disagree with what they're protesting, obviously. It's a free country. But at the end of the day, it's the politician's job to serve the people. And things like this are just going to happen. It's part of politics. And a skilled politician can use these types of moments to prove that they're willing to listen. And that solidifies the bond that they have with these communities that want to hear from them. Now, as a Bernie Sanders supporter myself at the time, I saw a lot of fellow Bernie bros get really angry about that. But in retrospect, I think that a lot of them would admit that that moment did not hurt his campaign. In fact, it helped his campaign because he then started to take issues of black Americans a lot more seriously. He didn't really have a choice. He had to. He was forced to, right? But he hired black staffers and started to have conversations with people in the community. And even though he still wasn't really where he needed to be by the end of the campaign, he did nominally improve because he was pressured to improve. Now, my hope is that this event right here in Detroit is going to be constructive in the end for Kamala. And I hope that she uses it as an opportunity to make a change for the better. Now, the positive news is that Kamala Harris and Tim Walls actually did meet with the uncommitted organizers, both Layla Elabed and Abbas Alaway, who are organizers for Michigan's uncommitted movement. So 
they both met with Kamala before the rally, right? So they didn't know that somebody was, was going to disrupt, and the people who disrupted her didn't know that she had met with uncommitted protesters, um, or organizers, I should say. But I want to show you a video of Layla where she's explaining what she said to Harris when they met and how well she thinks the conversation went, because this is crucial context that a lot of people haven't seen yet. I had a moment yesterday to briefly engage with VP Kamala Harris and Governor Tim Walt in the photo lineup um, when she was visiting uh, Detroit yesterday. Um, and in that uh, brief engagement, I did get really emotional. Um, I introduced myself. I was introduced as one of the co-founders of the Uncommitted National Movement. And the first thing I said to uh, VP uh, Harris was, I'm Palestinian. And I got really emotional after that um, because I was thinking of my community members who are losing hundreds of their family members. And I told VP Harris that. I said, Michigan voters right now want a way to support you, but we can't do that without a policy change that saves lives in Gaza right now. I meet with community members who are losing tens and tens and hundreds of family members in Gaza. Will you meet with us to talk about a arms embargo? And she you know, nodded. Um, she agreed, yes, we will meet. Um, and so I think it, in that moment, it felt reassuring. And this window of openness um, to meet with uncommitted leaders, um, to meet with Michigan uh, voters, to talk about what is necessary in this moment to save lives. Um, and I really felt that uh, VP Harris's uh, empathy towards me and empathy towards the plight of Palestinians was incredibly genuine. Uh, and also understanding that Palestinian children and men and women need more than just empathy or sympathy. We need a policy change that will save their lives. So when I stood there straightforward in front of VP Harris and looked her in the eyes and looked her in the face and told her of the very real human impact of our US policy, policy decisions, on voters right here in Michigan, community members right here in Michigan that are losing hundreds of family members. She told me it was horrific. She agreed with me, it's horrific. And she said, yes, I will meet with you. And I understand that when she agreed to meet with me, she did, wasn't agreeing to an arms embargo. She was agreeing to discuss an arms embargo and discuss a policy that will save lives now in Gaza and hopefully get us to the point where we can put our support behind uh, VP Harris, but we can't do that without guarantees um, in our for our community um, that will save our family members in, in Palestine. So credit to Kamala for meeting with them and hearing them out. And I'm really glad to see that she agreed to a formal meeting with them as well. That doesn't mean that she's going to implement an arms embargo to Israel and do what they want. But the fact that she's willing to hear them out, that creates a window of opportunity that wasn't there before. So this is important. Remember, Biden lost uncommitted people because of his complicity with Israel's genocide, and he hasn't done anything to rebuild the bridge that was burned with this community. So the fact that this dialogue right now is happening, that's really encouraging to see. But I do want you to hear from Abbas as well, because he was also there. And here's his thoughts on the overall feeling that he got when he came away from speaking with Harris. Uh, he was cautiously optimistic, as you're going to see. During my interaction, I looked Vice President Harris in her eyes and said, uncommitted voters, uncommitted delegates, we want to support you, but we need to see a more humane Gaza policy that includes an arms embargo that saves lives. And so I asked her directly, I said, Vice President Harris, will you meet with us to discuss an arms embargo? She expressed an openness to that. And I think we have a real opportunity right now to keep pushing for a change in this policy that has been, unfortunately, US policy for decades of sending unconditional weapons to occupy and dispossess and harm and kill Palestinians, we have an opportunity right now to push as hard as we ever have to get a change in that policy so that we can save lives and so that we can re-engage uncommitted voters who need to see this change ahead of the November election. Um, both Leila and I had interactions with the vice president where we asked specifically for a meeting to discuss an arms embargo and she expressed 
in both instances and openness. And so we find hope in that. We know that the vice president understands that this is a very important issue for voters across the country, including here in Michigan. And, you know, some of the noise that we're seeing today about, oh, well, she says she doesn't support an arms embargo, et cetera. Well, yeah, we know she doesn't support an arms embargo because U.S. policy for decades has been supplying the unconditional flow of bombs to kill people we love. That's precisely why we need an update to this policy so that we can save lives. We need an arms embargo. We need to stop sending bombs. And now is the moment to push as hard as ever because the killing has not stopped. It's accelerated. We need to save lives. While we were backstage, ahead of getting to interface with Vice President Harris, we talked to one party le leader after another and said to them, listen, if it were your family that was living under the bombs, we would expect that you would want our candidate to have a policy of stopping the sending of bombs to kill your family members. That's what we're doing. I hope you understand. And party leaders who we spoke to understood this. It was clear that Vice President Harris understood the gravity of the situation. And we found hope in the fact that she expressed an openness to engage. Now it's important for us to see her differentiate her Gaza policy from the, the, from the policy that we've seen the last 10 months, because we know that it's not sustainable. We know that it's deadly. It's yielded genocide. We know that Donald Trump's policies would be destructive. That's precisely why we need Vice President Harris to embrace an affirmative uh, uh, message that stops the killing so that we can mobilize voters who, for whom uh, Gaza is a top policy issue. Here in Michigan, over 100,000 voters self-identified and said, hey, this is a top issue for me. Around the country, over 740,000 people did the same thing, including in key swing states. We need a more humane policy so that we can mobilize those voters for whom Gaza is a, Gaza, a change in Gaza policy is essential. So understand that they're representing their community who has been directly affected by Biden's policies on Gaza. They know Trump would be worse. These are not Trump supporters. These are Democrats. But they're telling Harris that they're not going to be able to mobilize voters as effectively if they don't get the sense that she's going to reverse course here. And they're using this time right now to try to get a firm policy commitment from Kamala Harris because now is the time that you extract concessions because you have maximum leverage. They know that Kamala Harris knows Knows she needs their vote. So the goal here is to turn the uncommitted into committed, and they're telling Harris they want to help her, but she has to help them first. So I think that this meeting was constructive, and I'm glad that they are going to meet. I hope that that happens soon. But after Harris expressed an openness to an arms embargo, well, we got a bit of a setback when her national security advisor, Phil Gordon, took to Twitter to poo-poo that possibility, saying, VP has been clear, she will always ensure Israel is able to defend itself against Iran and Iran-backed terrorist groups. She does not support an arms embargo on Israel. She will continue to work to protect civilians in Gaza and to uphold international humanitarian law. Okay. This is a terrible statement, and I don't know if he spoke with Harris before making this statement, but this is not what you should be saying right now. Explicitly closing the door to an arms embargo when uncommitted voters are looking for any reason to come back is a surefire way to lose them permanently. It's bad politics, but it's also bad policy. And right now, Harris's team should be doing their best to smooth things over because it's not a good look to condescendingly tell protesters losing family members that they support Trump if they won't be quiet while you're talking i think that she handled it initially fine saying this is a democracy but then when she said you know you're supporting trump if you don't be quiet that's not a good look and by now harris should have expected disruptions especially in michigan and the fact that she didn't have a more empathetic response does not bode well she has to do better on this issue because michigan is crucial for her path to 270 but this isn't just about 270 electoral votes to be clear this is about saving lives People who care about Gaza are desperately hoping she'll be the hero they need right now. And this is the first test. And I don't know if she gets a passing grade. She gets points for sure for meeting with uncommitted organizers and committing to meet with them in a formal meeting. But I think that she gets points taken away for a response that's going to turn off a lot of Arab American voters who feel like she was dismissive of their concerns. Remember, their family members are dying in Gaza right now. So that's that's not what you want to hear. Now, listen, she has nothing to lose by committing to the policy that they're asking for. A majority of Americans support a ceasefire, therefore implementing an arms embargo on Israel to force a ceasefire 
That's only going to help her. She's not going to turn off moderates by holding Israel mildly accountable. This is what Republican administrations have done before as well. They stopped sending weapons to Israel when their prime ministers did not listen to their demands. So this is not something that's going to hurt her. Doing the right thing here will help her. Most Americans aren't as concerned about this issue as I'd want them to be. But she's not going to lose anyone for committing to stopping a genocide. That's not my opinion. That's what the polling data says. It says. But she can lose people for not explicitly saying that she will stop a genocide. The people who are paying attention are very plugged in. They care. This is their number one issue. Their family's lives are on the line. And when the margins are going to be so close in states like Michigan, she can't afford to lose anyone. Now, it's entirely possible that she's purposefully holding her cards close to her chest because she does think that strategically it'd be wrong to publicly commit to an arms embargo. Now, I don't know if that's her thinking, but I say this because the Labour Party in the UK gave us absolutely no indication that they'd be cutting off weapons to Israel. But after getting elected, they did that. So maybe that's her plan. Maybe she doesn't want to say what she's going to do because she thinks it would be unpopular. But that's why a meeting with the uncommitted leaders is so important because people who care about Gaza trust them. They trust Layla. They trust Abbas. So if she meets with them and gives them private assurances and they then tell their community that they strongly think that she deserves their support, that is going to make a very big difference difference. Not as big of a difference if they heard it from Kamala herself, but it's going to matter. But listen, this issue is not going to go away. That's a fact of reality. So it's important that Harris takes the time now to grapple with this and formulate a response rather than, you know, just kind of brushing it aside. So it seems like she wants to take them seriously. We'll wait and see. As for me, I am uh, will say cautiously skeptimistic here, as you should be with all politicians. But I, I do want supporters of Harris to know that this kind of criticism is healthy. And oftentimes it's very constructive. And this example from Climate Defiance about her running mate, Tim Walls, is going to demonstrate why I think it's actually really helpful sometimes. They write, quote, here's the story no one is telling you about Tim Walls. Until just a few years ago, he was a bona fide climate criminal. Today, he is celebrated as a climate champion. First, this is what the other environmental groups refuse to say. Tim Walls oversaw the construction of Line 3, the 700,000 barrel per day tar sands oil pipeline through his state. It has the carbon footprint of 50 coal plants. It emits more than all of Minnesota total. Walls' Line 3 pipeline lit a fire. Mass protests ensued. 2,000 people converged on the pipeline route. Some held the ground for a full week, braving heat and rain and a local landowner firing warning shots. Our founder, years before starting Climate Defiance, organized dozens of Minnesotans to shut down Tim Walls' fundraiser in protest of the Line 3 pipeline. Walls fled the stage humiliated. The Line 3 protests ultimately proved the turning point for Walls. He heard our cries. He felt the pressure building. He saw the power that the climate movement is creating and realized that he can no longer stand in the way of progress. Shortly thereafter, Democrats took full control of the Minnesota legislature. Walls seized the opportunity and helped shepherd a host of progressive bills across the finish line. One of them even mandated clean electricity throughout the state by 2040. They later conclude by saying Tim Walls became a climate leader, not because he had an epiphany, but because the climate movement built real political power. So the moral of the story is that politicians work for us and it is incumbent on us to make sure that they do what we want them to do. You can be enthusiastic about presidential campaigns, but at the end of the day, never lose sight of the reason why we all care about politics in the first place. We want to make people's lives better. That means we stop Trump. And it also means we push for the best policies that we can get. And look, when I was finally old enough to vote, I voted for Obama. That was my very first vote. And I cannot tell you how ecstatic I was about his campaign. But once he was elected, I tuned out. I trusted him. I started to explain away things that he was doing that I disagreed with. I made excuses for him. A lot of us did. But we all kind of learned a lesson from the Obama years. I speak for most millennials when I say this, I think. Never, ever stop holding politicians' feet to the fire. So I say all this to say, I don't want to be a buzzkill. You know, I haven't seen this much enthusiasm for a candidate since Obama, and I don't want to be the guy that throws a wet blanket on everyone when the vibes are so good. Having said that, though, we can't lose sight of the fact that politics ultimately is about people. And there's a genocide going on right now where 186,000 lives have been extinguished forever. They're never coming back. And their family members are begging politicians to care. And stop this. And if you're frustrated with the protesters, understand that this isn't a bad thing. It's a good thing.
You can disagree with them, but understand that this is democracy right here. The fact that they are able to confront politicians and not go to jail is that's really good, right? It's it's something we should celebrate. So you've got to understand that people are going to criticize Harris, but you've also got to be cognizant of the fact that there is a difference between constructive criticism and destructive criticism. Good faith criticism is necessary so Kamala Harris can get better and win. And we don't just want her to eke out a victory. I want this to be a blowout so we can put an end to the Trump era once and for all. But in order to make that happen, we've got to recognize that we're all currently in an unholy alliance right now, right? This is a coalition between lefties and liberals who don't often get along. And I'm willing to to grant liberals who might be turned off by, you know, criticism of the politician they're supporting a little bit of grace. But I hope that they'll extend that same sympathy to those of us on the left who feel like this pressure on Harris's campaign is crucial right now. We all want to win and we can go back to fighting each other on November 6th, right? But for now, we've got to try to meet each other halfway and try to hear out each other's concerns, uh, even if it's difficult. So I'm asking you to listen to the pleas from pro-Palestine protesters and the uncommitted movement. Hear them out and try to fight the instinct to lash out at them. We all know that we have to beat Donald Trump, but we increase the odds of doing that if we remain a united front and put aside our differences right now and hear each other out. So, you know, I'm not going to violate the ceasefire we have with liberals right now, uh, but all I ask is for a little bit of understanding and grace from people like this who show up and they protest because they're hurting.